It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, concerns are piling up about the government's back of the napkin plan to jam the Ontario Science Centre into a new lu private luxury spa and parking lot complex at Ontario Place. Last week, the Minister of Infrastructure told millions of radio listeners that she was, I'm going to quote, just verifying the numbers and triple checking before releasing the business case for this decision. Today, her team told The Globe and Mail that she won't be releasing it after all. To the Premier, what did the minister see in the numbers that led her to change her mind? Reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Very much, Mr. Speaker. Our government is saving the Science Centre. We are giving it a new home at the Ontario Place redevelopment. It will be a new tenant there. It will be an attraction for families, for tourists, for everyone to enjoy, Mr. Speaker. And the Premier was very clear this morning when he was questioned by the media that we will continue to work with the City of Toronto on both the Ontario Place redevelopment as well as the lands where the Science Centre sits, and we will do that. Any supplementary question? That answer, it simply isn't good enough. Taxpayers are already on the hook for millions of dollars for an elite private spa that absolutely nobody asked for. The government is committing the province to a 95-year lease, and they're moving a cherished public institution and all of its jobs from its home community into a much smaller space. So through you to the Speaker, couldn't the Premier at least reveal the business case for these decisions? Minister of Infrastructure. Do you know what's not good enough, in our opinion, is to leave this site here, here. into disrepair, That's right. to leave it the way it is. NDP like broken it things. is crumbling. It is eroding, and I'm speaking about Ontario Place. It is flooded. It is not enjoyed by the general public. Our government has been clear since 2019 that we have a vision for the site, that we want to bring it back to life. We want Order. it to be a place that families can enjoy 365 days a year, that families can enjoy throughout the whole entire day. And we will have that with the Science Centre, with Thermae, with Live Nation, with a 43-acre public realm space wow. that will be accessible by the Ontario Line, accessible to the public through all People modes of transit. Mr. Speaker, that is not good enough. Leaving the site to deteriorate, Response? we will bring it back to hey, life. Hey, hey. And the final supplementary. Speaker, perhaps they won't release the, release the business case because there is not one. Yeah. Just like there isn't a good case for housing on the Science Centre lands, we heard from the Toronto Region Conservation Authority on this. The TCR, TRCA was not consulted, of course, so they've been forced to explain that these lands are not safe to build on. It's on a ravine, Speaker. The government is piling on one bad idea onto another bad idea bad. here in a half-baked scheme that is losing credibility by the day. Why would any reasonable person, Speaker, take their word for it that this plan is in the public interest? To respond, the Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you, Speaker. And I really want to thank the Leader of the Official Opposition for her question. Uh, speaker, I think everyone agrees in this House that we are in a housing supply crisis. It is this Premier, this Minister and this caucus who recognises that and wants to make sure that we get housing built in Ontario. <laughs> speaker, after decades of disrespect, disarray by that government, <coughs> it is finally this government who is making sure that we're seeing absolute housing starts by 100,000 almost in 19, in, uh, two years ago and 96,000 last year. And more than that, what's so important is we're getting purpose-built, rental-built. That's what is more important because we want to make sure everybody in this Response. province has a roof over their head. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Confusing answer to that question, can I just say, because I just finished explaining that the Toronto Region Conservation Authority says you can't build there. Anyways, um, Speaker, my next question. This morning, we learned of some troubling allegations that have come to light 
regarding the Greater Toronto Hockey League. Allegations Order. that suggest that the teams in the league, which is supposed to be, by the way, non-profit, are being bought and sold for millions. The owners are avoiding having to pay taxes on the whole thing. To make matters worse, Speaker, wealthy parents are buying the ability to influence team rosters, dashing the dreams of players as young as nine years old from playing the sport that they love. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Will this government investigate these very serious allegations and do its part to put an end to cash for access culture in amateur hockey? For tourism, culture, and sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for the question from the Leader of the Opposition. I'd also, I don't know if he's here, like to thank Mr. Alou as Chairman of Hockey Diversity Alliance for the work that he has done in building and supporting communities that haven't had an opportunity to participate in hockey by funding. And we, as a ministry, are thankful and happy to support what he is doing. But I will also tell you, on specifically, as a guy who's been involved in sport a long time, coached rep hockey and rep football, um, I take these allegations very seriously. And as a result, at, at this time, these allegations, uh, they're being investigated by the GTHL. Now, the GTHL executives have actioned an independent investigation with respect to ethical issues of influence and governance. And yes, they're taking it seriously. And I know they're taking it seriously because they have hired a retired justice from the Once. Ontario Court of Appeal and a retired police detective to do the investigation. Supplementary question. Well, I'll tell you, Speaker, I was hoping for a yes. I was just hoping for a yes. Uh, it is not good enough, Speaker, to have the GTHL investigate themselves. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, with all due respect. Uh, Akeem Aliou, how, who the uh, minister just mentioned, uh, is here with us today in the uh, members' gallery. He is a former NHL player with Calgary Flames and the chair of the Hockey Diversity Alliance. And he came to this government, to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport, months ago. Months ago, Akeem showed the minister documents that formed the basis for these allegations, but nothing happened on the provincial end. And he is hoping and he is demanding that this cash for access culture end, that kids are able to play based on their ability, their talent, not if their parents are able to buy them a spot on a team. Speaker, back to the Premier. Will this government launch a public investigation into these allegations and close any loopholes that may allow numbered shell companies to buy and sell kids' hockey teams? Mr. Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, the ministry does not have a direct relationship with membered organizations as a provincial sport organization and has no authority. The GTHL is a member of the Hockey, Ontario Hockey Federation. And that's why you asked about action. There is action being taken. It's being taken, as I use the word, independently of the GTHL, which means, Mr. Speaker, that is separate from the GTHL executives. Once that information comes back, and you're right, if there is information that we need to follow up with the Ontario Hockey Federation, we will do exactly that. Now, the member opposite might want to shake their heads at what we're doing, but there is a process that we will go through, and if necessary, we will act based on the information we get from the investigation. Yeah. And the final supplementary, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hockey is important to me, as it's important to countless Ontarians across the province. It is part of our identity. I was the first female to play on my elementary hockey team. My daughter was the only female to play on the local boys' hockey team at a competitive level. Now I'm a hockey grandma. <laughs> and just as hockey is part of our identity, so are our values of fairness, inclusion, and accessibility. And we know it is not right when even the most talented children cannot play because their parents cannot buy off a spot on the team. Steer. Speaker to the Premier, will you do what is right and make sure children are able to play based on their abilities and their talent? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And though I wasn't applauding, I will applaud that statement because uh, in all my years of coaching, I couldn't agree more at all levels that 
young people in, in amateur sport, all the way up to his university, need to be judged on their play and who they are to be part of a team. Nothing else is acceptable. And if there is other things going on as being suggested, we will find that out through this investigation. I will tell you, no one is more passionate about creating opportunity for young people in sport because of what it does and how it helps young people through the process. When we find this out, if in fact there is something to find out, you can shake your heads all you want. I know a little bit more about this space than you might, and I will tell you, and I will tell you that we will act if necessary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Stop the clock. Please take their seats. Order. Order. The House will come to order. Order. Member for Carleton will come to order. Member for Brampton North come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Global News just broke this story. <laughs> Ontario Place for All has submitted seven freedom of information requests to, this, to the Ministry of Infrastructure, and for each of these seven requests, this government has refused to withhold, has withheld the requested information. One request was for the lease agreement between the Ontario government and the private Austrian spa at Ontario Place. This agreement handcuffs this generation and future generations of Ontarians into spending an estimated $650 million taxpayer dollars and cow-sharing operational costs for the next 95 years. Why won't this government release the lease agreement so that the people of Ontario can judge for ourselves whether this is a good deal? Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, let me just take things back a bit, okay? 2019, we announced our vision for the site. We announced we wanted to invest in the site to bring it back to life. 2021, we went out to the public again and informed them of the tenants that we were negotiating with. And then just last week, the Premier and I and, and the Minister of Tourism and Cor uh, Culture and Sport were out again to inform the public of the progress that we are making on the site. But you know what we've done? We have learned from the past mistakes of past governments. We will have tenants that are going to invest capital in the site to build a brand new all year round stage, Mr. Speaker. We will have Thermae that will build a wellness and sports rec facility and water slides with 12 acres of Order. public rump. But most importantly, Mr. Speaker, we Spots. will have tenants that will actually be contributing to the annual maintenance here, here. and repairs of the site so that it doesn't fall into disrepair like under their watch. They want this The next or the supplementary question, member for Park Till High Park. Thank you, Speaker. Since the minister didn't answer the question previously, I'll ask again. At the announcement to move the Ontario Science Centre last week, the Minister of Infrastructure said the business case that showed it was more expensive to renovate the Science Centre than build a new one would be made public in due time. The minister then said that she would release the business case to the public once the numbers were verified and triple-checked. The minister is now claiming that the business case is confidential and will not be released after all. The people of Ontario deserve answers. Show us the business case. Why the secrecy? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Infrastructure. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite, but please don't put words in my mouth that is completely inaccurate and inappropriate. But what we are doing, Mr. Speaker, is making the site sustainable. We will have three wonderful tenants, Science Centre, Thermae, and Live Nation. Live Nation and Thermae will now be contributing to the site, to the maintenance repairs, to keep the site clean 
to keep the site beautiful. Why? Because we don't want it to fall into disrepair like it was under the watch of the Liberal government. We want this site to be open for years and years and years and generations to come so that families have a wonderful place that they can enjoy with their families. Mr. Speaker, that is what we heard from the public through the annual consultation process that has been taking place for several years. Response. People want access to the site and they want to enjoy it with their families. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question for the Minister of Francophone Affairs. Ontario has the biggest Francophone community of Canada outside of Quebec, with 600,000 Francophones and many people who speak French. Access to quality services in French is actually extremely important. With this initiative, like the active offer that has been put in place recently, we want to be able to facilitate the access of Francophone people to services in French. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister tell the House how the strategy for French services is in place today and what they're doing? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank my colleague for these excellent questions. Contrary to what the federal government uh, does, uh, because they're stopping with their modernization project, our government, with the leadership of our, uh, of our premier, has modernized the framework of uh, the uh, French services. It is in November 2021 when the uh, Ontario strategy for French uh, services has been put in place, we have modernized these services, and this is what we did. We have actually put in place more services in French, and we have adopted integrated services, which are very effective. So working in collaborating with all the important ministries which are working on French services, we have identified the possibility of expanding the services in French. So, Mr. Speaker, contrary to the Liberal government, which only speaks, we, do, we don't only speak, but we act for our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. It is always encouraging to uh, hear how much our government is listening Franco-Ontarians who need services in French and how they help the access to services in French in order to let them have quality services in French. Many progresses have been done and our government wants to guarantee the continuity of these works after the uh, French community in Ontario is able to access new services. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us what they have done in order to facilitate the uh, work of these organizations in order to be able to offer uh, fr services in French. Well, in order to facilitate the designation of uh, these organizations, we have modernized the process in order to make it uh, a linear uh, method. So we have also services online in order to allow faster services in 2022, and also we work with other ministries in order to identify the organization which are interested in using the online designation method and we have put in place a new online method in integrating the uh, uh, three-year evaluation process the organization which chooses to obtain this designation according to the uh, French language services act they are actually engaging in offering services in French, and we know this is very important for the Francophone community, and this is why we continue to modernize the services and the process. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. I was contacted this week by a resident of York Region through a friend. The resident, an 80-year-old man, was just recently told that his prostate condition could no longer be controlled by drugs and that he needed surgery. He was offered two choices. He could wait for a year and a half to get surgery with his OHIP card through Mackenzie Health, or he could pay $6,000 with his credit card and get his care within three weeks at a private clinic. Speaker, can the Premier tell me how he can defend his health care policies when people have to pay to get OHIP covered surgery done in any reasonable time frame? 
Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. You know, the member opposite talks about the need for constituents to have access in a timely manner to surgeries, and yet opposes the very legislation and proposals that we bring forward that will ensure, in fact, we have those community surgical centres. Now, of, of course, the, the member has conveniently uh, left out some of the details of the uh, example that he gave, but I can assure you that organizations like Mackenzie Health that have accessed our surgical backlog recovery of almost a billion dollars as a result of investments that our government has made since the beginning of uh, 2019 have ensured that Ontario is in fact leading Canada in terms of the shortest amount of wait times. But we want to do more because we understand that there are people who are waiting too long for the necessary Response. surgeries. We will do that work. I hope the member opposite appreciates that that will make a difference for their constituents. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. The choice this man had was to use his credit card or to suffer, or to suffer. When the Premier's decisions mean that people have to wait ages to get surgery to relieve suffering or to prevent death, then he has failed. When will the Premier provide the funding for health care and health care workers so people are not suffering or forced to max out their credit cards to get treatment? Minister of Health. I'm done have a historic investment in terms of recruiting and training health care professionals in the province of Ontario. We have invested in capital builds, over 50 in the province of Ontario, to expand surgical operating rooms and make sure that we have that. Through Bill 60, Order. we will continue to expand what already exists in the province of Ontario, surgical community and uh, uh, surgical units to ensure that people can get access in their communities in a timely manner. This work is ongoing. It is the member opposite and the party they represent that continues to want the Opposition status quo. Opposition, come to order. Opposition, come to order. The next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Mines. Everyone across this province is eager to help advance Ontario's economic prosperity. Northern Ontario is critical to the future of our province, and unfortunately, its tremendous potential was ignored for too many years under the previous Liberal government. The rich supply of critical, mineral, criti critical minerals found in the North is particularly important in our transition to clean energy technologies, especially the production of electric vehicles, EV batteries. Building a robust supply chain means that we must be able to extract the minerals out of the ground ur with urgency in order for Ontario to become an EV leader in the world. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is strengthening Ontario's mining sector? To reply for the government, the Minister of Mines. Thank you to the member for the excellent question. Mr. Speaker, as an individual, that was raised at the mine site village of Dolman Domex in South Porcupine, Ontario. Our government not only recognizes the importance of the North, but we want it to prosper like the rest of the province. That's why our critical mineral strategy is so important, because it will connect the mineral-rich North well, with the manufacturing might of the South. This will create jobs and supply Ontario, Canada, and the world with critical minerals needed for the EV revolution and the technologies of tomorrow. Our strategy is backed by strategic funding in programs like the Critical Minerals Innovation Fund and Ontario Junior Exploration Program that will build the supply chain and find the minds of the future. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answer. We can see that the investments that are being made, like those at Umacore in Lennox and Addington and Volkswagen in, a, in their EV production plants in St. Thomas, clearly shows that our government is focused on building a strong made-in-Ontario supply chain. But we need those critical minerals to accomplish this. To capitalize on this generational opportunity, we must act with urgency and create the right economic conditions for investments in our province's mining and exploration industries. Critical minerals exploration is a key driver for creating good-paying jobs and building a strong, globally competitive economy. 
and it's vital that our government continues to make these targeted investments in order to help our companies search for minerals to be used in the automotive and battery manufacturing. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to expand exploration for these critical minerals here in Ontario? Minister of Mines. Thank you again for the excellent question. Last week, I was honoured to join the Minister of Finance in Thunder Bay to announce the additional investment of $6 million into the OGEP through budget the 2023. Nice. Mr. Speaker, that brings our total investment in the Ontario Junior Exploration Program to $35 million. Our efforts are working, Mr. Speaker. Last year, Ontario regained, regained the top spot for exploration spending with over $878 million invested. We're number one, sir. These investments are creating jobs for northern and indigenous communities so that they can be a vital part of the supply chain. Mr. Speaker, our government, under Premier Ford's leadership, is building the supply chain for EVs, and it all starts with expiration. Thank you. The next question, member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Eglinton Crosstown LRT is two years late and a billion dollars over budget. This government has missed two deadlines for it to open. To make matters worse, Speaker, leaked emails note the government is now silencing Metrolinx, who prepared a video update on the Eglinton Crosstown LRT. The Premier's office's staff would not allow that video update to be seen by the public. Simple question to the Premier, Speaker. What are you trying to hide? Reply, the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, I understand the frustration that community members feel with respect to project delays on the Eglinton Crosstown LRT. It's a project that we inherited from the Liberals, Mr. Speaker, and from the beginning, unfortunately, they mismanaged the project. But, you know, our government has been committed to doing transit differently. We brought forward legislation, the Building Transit Faster Act, that the opposition, unfortunately, voted against, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows better than almost anyone in this House that there are risks associated with rushing a project. Transit riders deserve a lot better than, uh, than the experiences of the Ottawa LRT, Mr. Speaker. And that's why our focus has been, and I have been clear on this since the beginning, our focus is making sure that the Crosstown opens as soon as possible, but that when it does, it is safe and, it is safe and reliable for transit riders. Supplementary question. Speaker, the is right about one thing. People in Ottawa Centre have seen this movie before. Back to the Premier. The problem for our city in Toronto here is that the same P3 consultants that designed our failing LRT, they are the same ones this government has under contract for the Eglinton Crosstown LRT. Oh. And red flags are popping up everywhere. For example, City News Toronto documented buckets of broken up chunks of the Sloan Station platform at Eglinton and Bermondsey, with barricades all of a sudden up everywhere after this LRT station appeared poised to open. The Toronto Star over the weekend reported, as I said before, Metrolinx officials are frustrated with this Premier's staff silencing them when they're trying to give the public an update on the project. Speaker, I agree with Councillors Cole and Matlow and others who said we need a public inquiry into this mess. Like that was I'd something like good order. enough for Ottawa. It should be good enough for order. the City of Toronto. Will the government commit to a public inquiry of the Eglinton Cross to NLRT today? Yes or no? Order. Minister of Transportation. Hey, Mr. Speaker, well, what I can commit to uh, the people of Toronto is that they will get a system that is safe and reliable to use once it is ready to open. With respect to the specific issue on the Sloan platform, platform Mr. Speaker, repairs are being made on a section of concrete that was identified through Metrolinx's very strict quality control and inspection process, and there are no additional costs required to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to fix this, uh, this platform, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, what people of Toronto Order. don't need are politicians forcing a system to open before it is ready. Order. That is what happened in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker, when the mayor of Ottawa demanded that they shorten the testing period. Opposition and then what happened, Mr. Speaker? 
derailments, Mr. Speaker. Transit riders were stranded and couldn't get to work and couldn't get home. Mr. Speaker, Response. we will not rush a system to open before it is ready. Transit riders deserve better, and that's what they will get under this government. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, the Premier likes to say under my watch, you'll only ever need your OHIP card, not your credit card. The Premier should tell that to Lisa, whose wait time for breast cancer surgery at the Ottawa Hospital was so long, she was forced to go to a private clinic to pay $50,000 for the life-saving surgery that she needed. And Lisa is not the only one. Wait times for breast cancer surgery at the Ottawa Hospital are so long, surgeons are advising their patients to consider private options. Dozens of women in Ottawa are having their life-saving surgeries delayed and then rescheduled. The uncertainty and the wait is agonizing. Speaker, how is any of this in any way acceptable to this Premier? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. You, you know, it is frustrating when people have to wait for long periods of time for their critical surgeries, which is exactly why we have brought forward through your health plan, Bill 60, which allows us to expand those community and surgical centres. You know, the example the member gave, there needs to be some context to it. And of course, that surgery, if it happens in the province of Ontario, is covered by your OHIP card. This is the same member from the City of Ottawa, who is opposing the innovation that is happening at the Ottawa Hospital today, where through our surgical backlog fund, we have the, the hospital has been able to utilize an innovative model that ensures an OR room within the hospital is being used on the weekend when it was sitting vacant before. What does that do, Speaker? It means that those critical surgeries that must happen and will continue to happen have uh, the ability to happen sooner Response. because we are utilizing those, OR, those, those OR operating rooms uh, over the weekend. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, I'm hoping in the supplementary the Premier will be able to explain to Lisa how he could allow this to happen. So, do you know how many? Do you know how many women at the Ottawa General uh, Campus, of the Ottawa General, uh, the Ottawa Hos General Campus, of the Ottawa Hospital, are getting their life-saving breast cancer surgeries within the safe recommended rate? Ninety percent? Seventy-five percent? No. Fifty percent? No. Twenty-five percent? No. Thirteen percent. One, three. 13 percent. And the situation for gynecological cancer surgeries is not much better. It's 30 percent. All the while, the hospital is renting out ORs to a private company, while these women watch that and wait. Every four weeks these breast cancer surgeries are delayed, the risk of death increases 6 to 8 percent. There's a reason that we started measuring wait times in 2007. So this wouldn't happen. So back again to the Premier Speaker. How did this Premier allow this to happen under his watch? Minister of Health. You know, the member opposite should also talk about the wait times that are happening across Canada because, in fact, Ontario leads Canada in the shortest wait times. Is that enough? Clearly not. We want to do more, which is why we are expanding uh, immediately through the surgical backlog recovery. Almost a billion dollars has been used by our public hospitals in the last three years to expand their operating room capacity, and it has worked because, in fact, we are now down to wait times that are equivalent to pre-pandemic levels. That is a success that we have to point and thank our hospital partners for. Is it enough? No, we don't want the status quo, which is why, through Bill 60, we are expanding the community surgical and diagnostic centres. That will ensure that Order. people have access to regular scheduled surgeries in a timely manner closer to home. It is exactly what the people Response. of Ottawa and Ontario need and deserve. Thank you, Speaker. Order. Order. Stop the clock. Member for Ottawa South will come to order. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks will come to order.
start the clock. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Good morning, Speaker, and thank you. My question is for the Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. It's important that Ontarians of all ages and abilities can participate in local programs across the province because of our government's commitment to helping seniors and people with disabilities to stay safe, active, and socially connected. We are hearing encouraging reports about successful projects through the Inclusive Community Grant Program. To name just a few examples, Speaker, the City of Burlington received funding to install portable beach mats to make access easier to the waterfront for everyone. The Public Library in Dryden received funds to make accessibility improvements as well. Speaker, can the Minister please share more about the Inclusive Community Grant Program and how this contributes to advance, advancing accessibility for all of Ontario? The Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you to the hardworking MPP from Chatham, Ken Leamington, for the wonderful question. We thank you and all the advocates of accessibility who are working hard to make Ontario more accessible. Our government launched the Inclusive Community Grant as a community-based approach to help the province become more inclusive for everyone. Since 2018, our government has funded over 60 projects to local organizations to make inclusive spaces meet the accessibility need in their community. These grants are making libraries, parks, and other public space all across Ontario accessible. Spons? Thanks to the leadership of this premier, we are building accessible Ontario. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. It's encouraging to hear that our government is making meaningful investments to help improve the daily lives of individuals and families across our province. And we all we all still know there's more to do. In every community, there are opportunities and challenges when it comes to reducing barriers so that people across Ontario can live active, healthy lives. Ensuring continuous improvement of accessibility and inclusion for everyone is an ongoing responsibility, and we all play a role in supporting the needs of our communities. It's vital that our government continues to provide funding that supports local needs and empowers community organizations so that improvements can take place everywhere in Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government is investing in accessibility projects in both rural and small urban communities? Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. The speaker, project by project, community by community, we are advancing accessibility. I want to share with you that we have invested nearly $50,000 in inclusive community grants to the Active Lifestyle Center in Chatham, Ken, Leamington. This funding went to the pressure driving force for older adults. This has supported up to 1,500 older adults from 11 rural and the smaller urban communities in Chatham can access driving to stay active and connected. It does not matter how big or small a community is, we can all work together to build a better Ontario that is inclusive for all. Response. Together, we are building a better Ontario. Yeah. Next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Windsor Salt workers from Unifor Locals 240 and 1959 have been on strike over nine weeks as they continue to fight for job security and against the outsourcing of their jobs by a U.S. hedge fund company, Stone Canyon Industries. These workers mine and produce the table salt, road salt, agricultural salt, and more that we all benefit from. In fact, the salt used in the kitchen and on the dining room tables right here at Queen's Park is Windsor Salt. Speaker, the Conservatives claim they're working for workers, so Windsor Salt workers want to know what specifically has the Premier done to support them during this strike and stop the outsourcing of their jobs? To apply, the government house leader. 
Well, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, let me just say that uh, we do appreciate how important these workers are to the province of Ontario. In fact, all workers are important to the province of Ontario, and that is why in the last election, a majority of the uh, unionized workforce across this uh, province supported progressive Conservatives uh, in the election, uh, including the members of the uh, now, the Minister of Labour has put forward a number of initiatives that improve uh, the, the working conditions, not only of workers, but more importantly, Mr. Speaker, or equally as important, Mr. Speaker, is that the conditions that we're bringing in are as a result of some of the incredible work that we're seeing by this, uh, by this, by this Premier and by this uh, uh, Minister to bring jobs and economic activity back to the province of Ontario. This province is thriving. We have thousands of jobs that are being created, thousands of jobs where we will turn to our unionized workforce, to workers across the province of Ontario to help us continue to build a bigger, better, stronger province of Ontario. And that includes those workers uh, that the member has referenced Order. in her question. Now, we encourage uh, both the workers and, uh, and, uh, and their employer to uh, reach a, uh, an agreement at the table, because I'm sure the member would agree that's exactly where it should be done. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I'll remind everybody it was actually the Conservatives that scrapped anti-scab legislation, and it's very clear what you feel about workers with Bill 124 and Bill 28. Yeah. Speaker, scab labour is used by employers to undermine collective bargaining and drag out labour disputes. The Conservatives have a track record of supporting the use of scab labour time and time again. I was joined by Windsor Salt workers here at Queen's Park to reintroduce, for the 16th time since the Conservatives cut anti-scab labour, our anti-scab labour bill. The Conservatives wouldn't answer whether or not they'll be supporting it. In fact, they wouldn't even look at the workers that were here. So I'll try again. Will the Premier tell workers today whether or not his government will vote in favour of our anti-scab labour bill and support Windsor Salt workers? Yes or no? Leader. I, I, I truly find the NDP entertaining. You know why, Mr. Speaker? Because this member gets up in her place supported by the members around her and suggest that, oh, we want to bring anti-scab legislation back. But when they had the balance of power, when they could have said to the Liberals, we demand that you bring back this legislation. Why? Because they held the balance of power. They could have said, workers are a priority for the NDP. Instead, they said that stretch goals on auto insurance is all that they needed to continue the disaster that was the Liberal government from 2011 to 2014. You didn't make workers a priority in 11. You didn't make them a priority in 12. You didn't make them a priority in 13. You didn't make them a priority in 14 when you supported every single disastrous Response. budget that that group brought to the province of Ontario that brought workers in this province to its knees. And now, when you're down to 30 people, it's a problem. Stop. 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 Order. Member, government House Leader will come to order. The member for Windsor West will come to order. I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair, not across the floor of the House. Start the call. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you, Speaker. The Minister of Finance frequently talks about transparency, about how his crystal ball is a bit foggy and how, quote, certainty is not part of the future, it is always uncertain, end quote. But now his government is saying they can predict the next 95 years with their new lease for Ontario Place. In 95 years, we'll be gone and a new generation of Ontarians will have to deal with the generational decisions of this government. The province and city of Toronto had a similar lease for the Ontario Science Centre, and now halfway through, the province is insisting that it be destroyed because it's too old. The minister knows a 95-year business case is not a sound one. Maybe that's why they won't release it. Speaker, can the Premier please tell us how his government now has the crystal ball confidence to, improve his, to approve his government signing a 95-year lease with a company that only set up shop in Canada two years ago? To reply? Minister of Infrastructure. I, I just I cannot believe that member is asking this question right now. They closed the doors to Ontario Place. They left it to go into disrepair, to be in a state where it is constantly flooded and at not and at times not safe for people. Now we have presented a vision to the public. We were out last week. The Premier was answering questions this morning. 
The Leader of the Opposition said very clearly, Order. standard commercial lease. Now our partners, our tenants, are making serious investments to the site, building a brand new stage that will be enjoyed all year round Order. as opposed to just the summer period. Therme Water Park Wellness Facility, which will also have 12 acres of public realm space and 43 acres of public realm space together and contributing to the maintenance response? and upkeep of the site, which you failed to do. Really? Take responsibility really? for really? your actions. Once again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Speaker, the government announcement to move the Ontario Science Centre was a shock to everyone except those in the deal room. It is anything but transparent. The government did not consult with the people of our community. They did not consult with the City of Toronto or the TRCA, who jointly own the land. The Science Centre is an important cultural and educational hub in North York, serving thousands of local students with programming and employing many people in my riding of Don Valley West and neighbouring Don Valley East. Moving it to Ontario Place means moving jobs and programming out of our community. Our community will be lessened culturally and economically with the loss of the Ontario Science Centre. This decision, made in secret, shows the lack of regard this government has for the people of Thorncliffe Park and Flemington Park. Speaker, can the pr Premier please explain how our community will benefit from this move and how much benefit will go to the developers to advise him to do this? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, this is a great opportunity for me to, after having a number of consultations with the Chair and the CEO, that reminding everyone that if you haven't been there lately, the Science Centre is open for business. There's a lot of great things going on there, school visits, an opportunity for people to go revisit if they haven't. Usually a lot of conversation around things that people don't understand because they haven't really examined it. But let me tell you this, when we talk about a potential world-class, world-class staging of down at Ontario Place, it's unbelievable. And then I talk, you know, all the conversations I've had with people across our province in tourism, so the one thing that really bothers me, Mr. Speaker, about this when I hear the conversation back and forth and ongoing while I am still speaking is the fact that Order. it sounds like members in the NDP are against tourism. Really? All those, all those people across our province that make a living, that provide income, are against tourism development. I'm shocked, Mr. Speaker. I'm just shocked. Next question. Member for Hastings, Lennox, and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. Oh, Speaker, roads, highways, and other critical transportation infrastructure are vital to ensuring that our economy remains strong and productive. Unfortunately, under the previous Liberal government, Ontario's transportation networks were neglected. In fact, Highway 33, known as the Loyalist Parkway, which spans across the southeastern portion of my riding and connects at Main Street in the village of Bath, would greatly benefit from improvements. But this is just one example. There are plenty of roads and bridges in municipalities all across the province that are desperately in need of upgrades. Our government must continue to prioritize investments in transportation infrastructure that will keep our communities moving safely and efficiently every day. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is supporting local communities, local municipalities, to revitalize their transportation infrastructure? To reply, the Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. I'm excited to answer that question because it's a great room from a member who does great work in his writing. I'm glad to inform that member, in fact, that two weeks ago that uh, our government announced $30 million in Connecting Links funding to support municipal road and bridge repairs in 21 municipalities across the province. That means, Speaker, that we're dedicating just over $317,000 to help revamp Main Street in Bath Village in that great member's riding so folks can get around and connect to Highway 33 with East Speaker. Our Connecting Links program provides funding up to 90 percent of eligible project costs to enhance municipal roads and bridges that run through communities that connect to provincial highways. Speaker. This funding 
will make sure it makes it easier to connect people to jobs, to move movement uh, of goods and services, and to generate economic growth, and to take the House Leader down to celebrate the Leafs Cup win when that happens <laughs> later this year. <laughs> Speaker, just like Leafs fans Response. after last night's win, they're buzzing, Ontarians are buzzing, because unlike the NDP and the Liberals, this government is getting transportation done. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. It's terrific to hear how the government's investments will restore vital transportation arteries in communities across Ontario, specifically in the village of Bath. There's still more work to do when it comes to expanding our transportation networks. We know that clogged roads and gridlocked highways impact individuals, families, and businesses, resulting in delays and inconvenience that waste time and money. Right. Road congestion prevents the trans transportation trucks from moving our goods efficiently, especially the 401 in eastern Ontario, costing more than $11 billion annually to Ontario's economy. Ontarians are counting on this government to continue to implement projects that will connect more people to jobs, housing and economic opportunities all across the province. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please elaborate on how our government will deliver on the promised plan for these transportation infrastructure improvements? Associate Minister of Transportation. Speaker, I'd love to elaborate because this province is booming and the population is growing by hundreds of thousands of people a year. That means the time to invest into our transportation infrastructure is now. And Speaker, despite the heckling of the NDP for some reason, we're going to do exactly that. $27.9 billion over the next 10 years to expand highways and revitalize our transportation infrastructure. From the twinning of the QEW Garden City Skyway Bridge to expanding the 401 between Pickering eastwards and, of course, the widening of highways 11, 17 and 3. Our government is building transportation throughout the province, Speaker. A lot is getting built over the next decade, with so much happening both now and in the coming years. In fact, Speaker, in the next fiscal year alone, we are investing $3.2 billion to expand, repair provincial highways and bridges. Then over the next four years, the Ontario Highways Program will focus on more than 600 expansion and Response. rehabilitation projects. Through all this work, Speaker, we are not only building this province for the people of today, for those moving here in the future. That includes Habs fans, like the member who asked that question. <laughs> so the next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, actor artists are gig workers. Almost a year ago, the ad, ad agencies who hired these artists demanded a 60 per cent cut to the rates, they demanded an end to retirement contributions, and they demanded to end their benefits. And instead of bargaining, the ad agencies locked out actor members and hired scab replacement workers. Yeah. My question, Speaker, is will the Premier commit to passing NDP Bill 90, the Anti-Scab Labour Act, which would prevent the use of replacement workers and protect the bargaining rights of workers? The government house leader. <laughs> speaker, again, look at the NDP, right? They didn't care about actor workers when they had the balance of power. Now, let me just explain for the NDP, let me explain Order. for the members opposite what the balance of power means. It means that you can decide whether a government is in power or is not in power. You had that ability. You had the ability between 2011 to put the Liberal government out of its misery and to bring back order and prosperity to the province of Ontario. But more importantly, more importantly, order. they had the power to bring back this legislation when they could have guaranteed that it passes. But they didn't Opposition do come to order. Now, when the people of the province of Ontario have reduced them to a small rump in the Legislative Assembly, they bring forward legislation that they say is a priority, but it's just not a priority when they have the opportunity Response. to pass it. Instead, what we're doing is we're giving the workers of this province the opportunity to succeed, Mr. Speaker. And you know what that has resulted in? 600,000 jobs. Order. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. There's not a worker here who believes what he's saying. I'll tell you what happened, because I was sitting right there when I was in strike and scabs were crossing my picket line. The Liberal Party counted the number of Conservative members. My Liberal MPP hid in the back room while the Conservatives voted down anti scab. And if they really believe anti scab, they pass it today or they table their own. For more than 60 years, Speaker, Action performers have made commercials through the National Commercial Agreement, and instead of bargaining, advertising agencies have locked up the workers. And a lot of the government's advertising is done by ad agencies like FSB and Leo Burnett. And they are using scab replacement workers for Crown Corporation ads like the OLG and Metrolinx Master Band. 
Actors members have been locked up for nearly a year. Nearly a year of them turning their back on these workers. Will the Premier commit today that the Government of Ontario and the Crown Corporation who's accountable to it will not use replacement scab workers in any Ontario government funded ads? Will you have these workers back? Yes or no? Speaker, but what the member fails to say is that when the NDP then had the opportunity to support a motion of non-confidence that the Progressive Order. Conservative opposition brought forward, they voted in favour to keep the Liberal government in power. If the member was so angry, if the NDP were so passionate about that vote, then why didn't you Order. take them down? You could have saved the people of this province billions of dollars. Instead, you supported them. And you the government house leader will come to order. Member for Sudbury will come to order. The member for Sudbury will come to order. The, the government house leader is warned. The member for Sudbury is warned. And once again, I think for the fourth time, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Start the clock. The next question. The member for Scarborough Centre. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of, Minister of Colleges and University. This week, most students in post-secondary education programs will be closed to finish their academic year. Before the start of their summer break and while completing another academic year, and for some, their degrees is a call for celebration. We know that the exam session can be a stressful time for students and impact their mental health. That is why it is so important for students to have mental health resources on campus that are accessible and available to them whenever they need it the most. Speaker. Stop the clock. I'm just going to remind members that after they've been warned, if I have to speak to them again, they will be named. That applies to everybody. Start the clock. I apologize to the member for Scarborough Centre. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is continuing to make mental health support available for our university and college student across the province? Thank you. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Scarborough Centre for raising this important issue. As minister and as a mother of three university-aged daughters, I personally understand how important it is to support post-secondary students' mental health and create the right conditions to help young people succeed in their post-secondary journey. I'm proud to say that since day one, our government has taken action to support a healthy Ontario. And that includes in our 2023 budget, where we outlined our continued investment of $26.5 million in mental health supports for post-secondary students across the province. That ensures that more social workers, psychologists, and support staff on our campuses and virtually to support our students when they need it most. Because we know that the post-secondary education journey can sometimes be tough, our students deserve to have the resources they need to navigate those challenges and ultimately thrive and excel. Speaker, our government understands that improving mental health supports for students, Response. our post-secondary students, to succeed will create a stronger and healthier Ontario. Great. Any supplementary question? Thank you, Minister, for that great question. It's great to hear that more funding is being provided for mental health to support workers on our campus. However, we know that there are still many students who require time help, timely help throughout the summer, and unfortunately that they cannot always access the help they need, especially 
those who have returned to their home community after an academic year concludes. The reality is mental health support are needed both on and off campus, and that is and that these uh, support are needed beyond the regular school year. Young people across our province need access to resources and that understand their unique need and will support them in, in their personal mental health journey. Question. Speaker, can the minister, can the minister please uh, elaborate on, uh, on, on what mental health services are in place to support students year-round? Thank you. For colleges and universities. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for their concern over the mental health supports of Ontario's post-secondary students. We have been investing in programs that support students wherever and whenever they need help because we want them to know that they are not alone and that no one should ever suffer in silence. This includes supporting initiatives like Good to Talk, a mental health helpline solely for post-secondary students that is available 24-7, 365 through phone, text or even live chat. We also support a new virtual health, mental health app called Get Ahead, which is available to students at all publicly assisted institutions across Ontario that they can access whenever they feel like they need help or someone to talk to. And these support, supports are on top of those offered on campuses at our colleges, universities and Indigenous institutes. Speaker, through these investments, we will continue to bolster mental health supports at institutions Fonts. to support students throughout their post-secondary journey and set them up for success. To all the students out there, including my own daughters, who deserve uh, exams coming up and uh, beyond, also always prioritize your physical and emotional health being, and I send all students best wishes on their upcoming exams. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My constituent, Angela, recently received a 20 per cent rent hike, totaling over $400 a month, which is something that she and her fiancé did not budget for and simply cannot afford. Yesterday, this government voted down a motion from the NDP to bring real rent control to all buildings. What is the Premier going to do to protect Angela and her neighbours from this unaffordable, yet legal, rent hike? Apply. The Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you, Speaker. And I do want to thank the member opposite for her question because it does allow us to highlight some of the work that our government is doing, especially through Bill 97. Um, speaker, as we've heard many times before, two years ago we had record housing starts. By doing that, we are building more housing for everybody right across this province. And the best part about that is the purpose built rental is being built. But you know what? I'm not going to take. Um, <laughs> Any lessons from the NDP? I'd just like to remind everyone once again, in 1992, when the people of Ontario entrusted them to be the majority government, they had rent control at 6%. Inflation was only at about 1.4%. How do they justify that? That is their record, and that is what they did. They say no every response. time this government puts something forward. They say no to requiring landlords to make efforts to negotiate a repayment agreement with the tenant before the landlord-tenant board to make it easier so that nobody has to get evicted. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Under this government, rents are now in increasing in Ontario by 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 percent. These are stories I hear every day, every week. There's over 30,000 tenants who, have, who have now are, are in rent arrears, over 32,000 backlog cases at the Landlord Tenant Board, over 85,000 Toronto households who are on the wait list for social housing. A one-bedroom apartment in the City of Toronto now costs over $3,000 a month, a historic high under this government. If not for real rent control, what exactly, what exactly is the Premier going to do to stop rent gouging in Ontario? The Associate Minister of Housing. Speaker, once again, I just want to highlight some of the things that we are doing for renters in this province. You know, once again, as they say, continue to say no over and over again. It is 
this Premier and this Minister and this Government that's standing shoulder to shoulder with tenants across Ontario as we take decisive Order. action to strengthen tenant protections and remedies. That's why Ontario rental housing starts has gone up once again with records in the beginning of this year. That's why Ontario, Ontario is the number one jurisdiction for people to come to live. This is the no choice of calls. people from across the world. This is a choice from all um, great businesses to come here Response. and start a business, to grow a business. The Minister of Economic Development is bringing amazing companies here. We need the housing for the people who are going to work there. We're building the infrastructure, the communities, the hospitals, and we're reducing red tape to make sure it all gets done. Here, Thank here. you, Speaker. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.